Today we're going to talk about My Brother and Me and the Famous Battle of the Back Seat in 1961. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here to join in worship. Let's join together as we celebrate Peace with Justice Sunday in the United Methodist Church. I'm Dan Jeffrey, the pastor of the Sussex United Methodist Church. Let's listen to a prelude from our great organist Sharon Craig as she plays Put Your Hand in the Hand. so glad you've chosen to join us for this time of worship. I hope if you like what you see, you will uh, indicate that you like the video and like the page. Follow the page so that you can see our upcoming events and upcoming worship times. And also, I hope you'll share that with, with your friends so that they can also find out about us. Check us out also on YouTube. We archive our services there as well on the Sussex United Methodist uh, Church uh, channel on YouTube and you can subscribe to that for free and keep getting notices of when we post new videos there. So let's join together in a time of worship as we sing our opening hymn, Be Still My Soul.
coming in a time of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We remember that every day from you is a gift, an opportunity to share your love, to share your compassion and your, your hope and your faith in us and in each other and in the future. Lord, we know that there are many who are hurting now, who are suffering. Baldwin's and Rich are recovering from illness. People are mourning the loss of loved ones. People are struggling with a sense of injustice, with a sense of fear and worry, with a sense of concern about the future, because of all that is going on in our country, because of all of the illness that has been faced, because of our isolation from each other. People are filled with fear and anxiety, and they need your sense of calm, your sense of justice, your sense of hope. And so we come before you with humility, lifting up all those who need your help, all those we rely on to take care of us, and coming with confidence to say the words you taught us to say as we pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Let me now invite you to give ear to a reading from the Holy Scriptures as we listen for a word from God in the words of the prophet Micah in chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord? and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tenth, tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? A word from God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Will you join me in singing, It Is Well With My Soul?
I want to take a moment to speak to kids. I told you I was going to tell you about the battle of the back seat. I don't know if you've ever had anything like that, but my brother and I were little kids. We used to get bored on long car trips. We sat in the back seat and we were trying to deal with the fact that we were bored by getting on each other's nerves, I guess. Somebody would say, your foot is on my side of the floor. No, it's not. Your foot was on my side of the floor. You were reaching out with your hand to take over part of my side. Not so. You were. You were rustling papers and irritating me. You were causing all kinds of trouble with your music. You shouldn't be doing that. Stay over there and look out your own window. You were looking out my window first. We would argue back and forth until my parents would get annoyed and say, can't you guys be quiet? Can't you just sit there in peace and get along? Can't you just get along? It reminded me of something I heard from a comedian many years later saying, parents don't care about justice. They only care about quiet. They only care about peace. But the truth is my parents knew that you can't only care about peace and quiet because you can't really have peace without justice also. You need to have a sense of fairness and concern for everybody. And if somebody in the family didn't feel that they really believed that, that they really cared about what was going on in the back seat, what was really right, what was really fair, that would have produced just an ongoing festering irritation, an annoyance, a frustration, and a sense of not being fully loved. So my parents always made a point of caring what was going on and what was being said, not only about whether we were being quiet, but about whether we were treating each other kindly and fairly. They made a point of telling me over and over again that I was the big brother, and that meant that I should be more mature and kinder to my little brother. They would tell my little brother not to get on my nerves unnecessarily, because even though I could be bossy at times, I had a big sense of responsibility. And so they encouraged him to be forgiving, but they also recognized that there were times that I could be pushy and give him a hard time unfairly. And so they would be sure to rein that in and make us be kind to each other. The issue was not just kindness, but fairness, that we were always confident that they were treating us with equal love, that they were treating us with equal affection and kindness, and they were treating us fairly in the rules that they made. They didn't have one rule for one and a different rule for somebody else that was always giving the advantage to one of us or the other. That way, we always had a sense, not only that they cared about peace and quiet, but that they also cared about fairness. We always need to care about both. Because by being fair to each other, we encourage peace and getting along. By caring about fairness, we also can manage to be peaceful without being resentful and angry at each other all the time. That was a good thing. It was a good lesson to learn, something we've always tried to carry forward, that we care about everybody. Because God does care about all of us. God cares about all of us, regardless of whether we're big or little, whether we're young or old, and whatever our skills or abilities are, we are loved in the sight of God. That's a good thing. That's something we can remember always as we go through difficult times and remind the grown-ups of it, too. So let's pray. God, we thank you for taking care of us. We thank you for caring about whether we are getting along. We thank you for caring about what's right and what is fair. And we pray that you will help us care about that too, so that we will be fair to others, so that we will be kind to others, so that we will be humble in walking along with you, so that we will never forget that you are our heavenly parent, the one who loves us more than anything else. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been a difficult week in the country. There's been so many things going on, so many hurt feelings, so much anger, so much moving around of people in crowds, so much violence, so much 
anguish over where it is all leading to. You can see that situations like this develop over time. They don't develop all of a sudden. They develop out of a growing sense of anguish and out of a sense that he, people get of not being heard. The list of news stories over the years have been long and extensive of people outraged over what they have felt as injustice and people not caring whether people are not treated fairly. You remember all the stories. Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Martin Gugino. This, the list goes on and on, and because the list goes on and on, frustration builds and builds and bursts out in demonstrations and bursts out in anger. And that creates danger. When there is danger, there is also the chance for overreaction. And you get a feedback loop between people on different sides feeling they're at risk and they're in danger and they're frightened. You get a worry at the distance of where it is all leading. Will the whole country collapse? Will it all fall to pieces in terms of violence and outrage and rocks and bottles thrown, police billy clubs, tear gas, rubber bullets? Is the whole country falling to pieces? I don't want to talk in great detail about who's right in particular situations. Because the news is so confused, the reports are so scattered in so many directions about particular incidents of police conduct and particular incidents of conduct on the part of demonstrators. Maybe there are outside organizations involved in some of the demonstrations, and maybe they represent different viewpoints than the demonstrators as a whole. But it's clear there are huge numbers of demonstrators who are honestly feeling outrage and concern at what they think is long-term unfair treatment. And it is worthwhile, particularly from a distance, as we have the luxury of being at in Sussex, where we're out in the country, far away from all these activities for the most part, that we can take a look and see how we can react to try to help. Not just to try to judge what the other people are doing, whether we are acting like movie critics, deciding whether we think the police are acting right, or whether we think the demonstrators are acting right. In some respects, the underlying issues can get lost if we only focus on those things. If we only focus on reports and interpretations by reporters of what's going on, we can lose track of underlying issues. The underlying issues of justice are way more important. The issue of fair treatment is central to the idea of democracy. The idea of police trying hard to be just and fair is central to our civil order. The idea of trusting police to do the right thing is central to the success of our society. How can police know how to behave in these contexts when they are expected on one hand to be respectful and kind, and on the other, to maintain order. How can people stand up for justice and at the same time respect others that they may not trust? How can people from a distance look to issues of justice without getting caught up in the score counting of who's doing the right and who's doing more of the right and who's doing more of the wrong? Here's where I think our scripture lesson comes in and can be helpful to us. The scripture says, what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. That's useful in times like this to keep remembering because the first duty we have, the first duty we have is to do justice. Not call for justice or love justice or care about justice, but to do justice. In our own lives, in every interaction we have, to make sure that we are acting fairly toward others. To make sure that we are thinking first, not about whether we are worried, or whether we are afraid, or whether we are confident of our position, our livelihood, 
and our status in society, but whether we can be fair and kind to others. Part of that is emphasizing in our own minds over and over again that whenever we are advantaged in society, either in terms of how much money we have or in terms of our social standing or in terms of how we are treated by the society as a whole, the more advantaged we are relative to other people, the higher our duty is to share, to be compassionate, to be kind, to let our concern and our compassion outweigh our sense of entitled rights. That's important all the time because one of the things that comes with being advantaged is not being as aware of things that are unfair in the society. We can find ourselves surprised by things we didn't know happened anywhere at any time. I was reminded of this a few years ago when I was told by classmates that they felt that driving through the town on their way to our seminary, they were being stopped by the police over and over again for nothing, just to see why they were there. They looked like out-of-towners. I thought, here? No, I've lived here for years and years. I know that that's not, that's not going to happen. And then shortly after that, I was stopped by the, by the police for driving too fast in the town. Don't tell anybody. This was unintentional. <laughs> I was driving through the town and I lost track of the speed limit and the police pulled me over. They asked to see my driver's license and registration, as they always do. And when they saw it and saw that I was living locally, they said, oh, you're a local person. Don't do that again. Be safe and be sure you follow the speed limits. Have a good day and let me go. Initially, of course, I was thrilled. I was glad to be not in big trouble, not to have a big fine to have to explain to Marcia. But the more I thought about it, the more odd it seemed to me that I was forgiven only because I lived here locally. There was a way that I was advantaged because of where I lived who I was that I was totally unaware of. I don't say this to complain about the police or to complain about their treatment of me or their efforts to be honest in, the, in enforcing the law. I raise it in the sense that I had an advantage and didn't know it. That happens to us all the time in our lives. We, I had an advantage getting into, into college because of who my parents were. My kids had an advantage getting into the same college because I was an alumnus of the college. That will tend over time to produce the same kinds of students in the colleges generation after generation. Not because anybody intends anything unfair there, but because that has a tendency that is baked into the system. We know these things happen all over the place, but if we are the ones receiving the advantage, and not to notice. That gives us a special responsibility as, as the church, as followers of Jesus, to look for ways in which we are advantaged and to always go out of our way to be kind and helpful and fair to others. More than fair even to those who are disadvantaged. To care more about those who have not had the same advantage as we have had. That's tough. I know that's tough. Sometimes it doesn't even seem fair, but it is an act of love. So do justice. Love kindness. Love kindness is central to Jesus' whole life. Everything that he did showed a preference for kindness and love and compassion over rule keeping. Every time somebody came to Jesus and said, this person should be in trouble because they have not done the right rules on the Sabbath, or because they have not washed their hands properly, or because they have violated this rule or that, Jesus always seemed to find a reason to stand up for those who were, who were being picked on. To stand up for those being picked on, not because he didn't care about behaving properly or being right, but he cared about kindness more. He cared about kindness and love more than anything else. 
And that ruling principle helps keep us on the path of being with God and not just focused on ourselves. Third, walk humbly without God. I think it's important always for us to remember, pastors more than most, that we don't have all the answers. We don't know everything. We don't understand everything that's going on. We haven't heard all the facts. We don't know what's in people's hearts or what's in their minds. We need to be humble. We need to be humble in walking with God as well because it's very easy to begin to think especially if you're a pastor I think that we know what God is thinking we know what God wants we know how God views all the events that are going on in our times that can get us in trouble that can get us in a position where we put our thoughts as if they out into the public as if they were God's thoughts also we can assume that whatever we think is right must be the truth because we're people of faith. That's of course not true. If we think about it, we know that we have to be humble in our walk with God and careful about assuming that we know everything that's right. That implies that we will listen carefully to people in their own words, listening to them rather than just listening to reports and interpretations from others about what's going on. Try to find out what is making people upset. Try to find out what is making people afraid. Try to find out what we can do to show kindness and love and do justice. So justice, kindness, humility. These are the ways that lead to peace. But they are also the ways that lead to justice. They go hand in hand. They go hand in hand in all of our lives, not just in public issues, not just in issues involving people who we don't know, but people that we deal with all the time. People who are all around us all the time expect kindness and love and fairness from us. That's the center of what God expects from us. And we are surrounded by a love that makes all that possible. That's what gives me hope in these crazy times. That God's love surrounds us all. God's compassion reaches out to all of us and that we can be part of that great project of compassion and love. I hope that you will pray with me this week for a new birth of compassion and love in our, in our communities, in our country, in our world. That we will all care for each other. That we will all live in ways that show our compassion and our love for each other in dealing with the coronavirus, in dealing with issues of fairness in society, in dealing with just people that we do business with every day in the stores and in the service businesses of our economy. We ask that we join together, but we ask that God will help us in this. So let's pray. God be with us always. As we go through difficult and crazy times, give us confidence and hope in your love. Let us know that you do not let go of us. Let us know that you surround us with love so that we may surround others with love. And so that we can make a difference in the world. Because the world is so full of hurt. It is our job to help. We thank you that you give us that task. And thank you that you don't ever let go of us as we go about it. We pray in Jesus' name. Yeah. Now, a couple of quick announcements. I keep being asked, when are we going to be back together? And of course, we are working on that. We're working on that and hopeful that that will not be long. We are required as, as a church to, do, to look at two things. First, to follow all of the government rules and requirements in connection with public gatherings. We are watching those closely as they develop from the governor and other authorities. We also are expected by the conference to have a, a written approved plan for reopening to make sure that we have thoughtfully considered all the requirements and logistics for keeping people safe and that we have plans and procedures and the people necessary to take care of all of those things, to respond to five pages of questions 
about what we're going to be doing. We need a variety of people to be willing to help with that, to make that possible. People who are willing to be ushers and guides, to put cars in the right places and chairs in the right places. Attendance takers to take not just head counts, but actual names of people who are, who are present in our worship gatherings, so that if anybody does get sick, we'll be able to trace who they had contact with. We need restroom guides in case anybody has an emergency need to go to the restroom. We need set up helpers and cleaners. If you're willing to help in any of these ways, I hope you will. My hope is that we'll be able to follow much of our usual pattern of having outdoor worship in the summertime, maybe beginning with parking lot uh, drive-in uh, worship, and we also need places for people who don't have cars. Uh, we will work our way into these things gradually beginning toward the end of this month. Don't be afraid that we won't ever get back together. We definitely will. We'll have to adapt to circumstances. If the virus gets worse, we'll have to back off. If the virus gets better, we'll have to work ahead. We will be doing these plans carefully. We don't get extra points for being first. We get more satisfaction from keeping everybody safe and caring for other people because our first goal is do no harm. Let no one become infected or endangered because of our actions as United Methodists. I appreciate your support in that. I appreciate your commitment to caring for others, particularly for those who are more vulnerable than we are. So thank you for that. As we continue to work through these things, keep your prayers going and let us know how you can help. I also hope that you will continue to serve the community in the ways that have become so important to us. We have been not in acting in a variety of ways. In our, in our Skylands district, all the clergy got together this week and drove to Bristol Glen in a parade. We paraded all around the facility, honking our horns and waving to people and showing signs to indicate that we care about the people who are living there and all the people who are working there so hard uh, at this United Methodist facility. We brought snacks for the workers and cards for the residents and the workers and the outpouring of affection and appreciation from those who were there was really tremendous. That got me to thinking about our ability to do that as a church for other nursing homes and retirement facilities in our area, and I think we can couple that with our worship services, so we'll work on plans to do just that. We're also continuing to send cards and pictures to our hospital workers, uh, send those to Randy Parks at Newton Medical Center Spiritual Care Department. 175 High Street, Newton, New Jersey. Uh, and I hope you'll continue also to send decorated rocks with pictures of cardinals on them as, as a gift to people who have lost loved ones in the pandemic as a sign of love and a sign of hope for the future. We're continuing to do those things and collect those in our Helen's House uh, office building in the entranceway. I hope you'll continue to support us in those ways also hope you'll continue to acquire uh, food gift cards from our local grocery stores so that we can give those to families who are in need. It's meant a great deal to a variety of families in our area, and I hope you'll continue to do that. Thanks to everybody who has been participating. Thanks also for your continued support for the church. The church is so much needed these days in our community and in our world. We have meant a lot to many people, not only here in our own community, but at far distances, people have contacted me through seeing these videos. We need your support. Please send your checks to PO Box 244 in Sussex, New Jersey, or go online to gnjumc.org slash online giving. We'll post those addresses on email and in our, in our website and on our Facebook page. I hope you'll continue to provide your support so that we can be a support to others in our community and thank you for helping in all the ways that you can. Now is a time when we share that great mystical communion with each other and with Christ. Christ promises to be with us always, whenever two or more are gathered in his name, and we are gathered here now. We can share in this feast in whatever way you are comfortable doing. We can, if you have bread and juice or wine at home, Please share at the appropriate time. We'll do that together. We'll bless these things together. We will share. Or you can just watch, share in the prayers and the responses. 
I hope you will find this a meaningful time as we share the words of the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, O Lord our God, creator of the universe, our holy and loving parent, God Emmanuel. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we join in their unending hymn, singing together. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. and blessed are you, Lord Jesus Christ, who became flesh and dwelt among us on earth, offering yourself fully for our benefit. On the night in which you gave yourself up for us, you took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to your disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, you took and blessed the cup. You gave it to your disciples and said, This is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance and celebration we now offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with your own offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, singing together, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. O Holy Spirit, pour out upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. All honor and glory be to you, most holy Trinity, now and forever, as we sing together. Amen. Amen. is gluten-free bread as a reminder that we want to be inclusive and share with everyone whether they have a gluten allergy or not because we know there is one loaf we who are many throughout the world are one body for we share together in the body of Christ the cup of blessing we share is using grape juice so that even those who are dealing with alcohol addiction know that they can come without fear to share at the Lord's table. Because when we share this cup of blessing, it is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The body and blood of Christ, the life, the death, the resurrection, the eternity of Christ, all ours to share because of the one who loved us. 
common, let us share the feast. for sharing this time. Thank you for being here in this communion. This is a time for sharing and joy, a time for hopefulness about the future, a time when the church can be a source of light and hope to a world in darkness. Not because it's our light or our hope, but because it is the light and hope of the love of God that never lets us go. Oh Lord, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself for us. Grant that we may go forth in the light of your Spirit, the strength of your Spirit, to love and serve others always. Amen. Will you join me now in our closing hymn, which is Let There Be Peace on Earth. Let's go forth from this time and place to love and serve the Lord and begin the work of peace and justice wherever we go. We can go into places that we're afraid, dealing with people we don't care for, helping those who are in need, even when it is inconvenient to us or troubling to us or frightening to us, without worrying because we know that wherever we go and whatever we do, and whatever happens to us, the love of God the Father, the parent of us all, the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit will go with us and abide with us now and always. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Amen.